I will tell you a story. It won't be a happy family tale. It's a story about human psychology, control, and manipulation. And the worst part of this story is not the events unfolding in it. The worst part of this story is that it's true. The story begins in a fast food restaurant, where Louise, an employee, is about to experience the worst day of her life. However, the day starts like any other. Employees serve customers, do their jobs, when suddenly a phone call interrupts the routine. A police officer informs about a theft that occurred in the restaurant. He claims that Louise stole a wallet from a customer and asks the assistant manager to inspect her personal belongings and confiscate her phone. After the search yields no results, the officer requests the manager to detain the girl until his arrival. And this is just the first of many increasingly questionable requests awaiting her ahead. In April 2004, Louise Ogborn from Mount Washington, Kentucky, celebrated her 18th birthday. As one of the top 10 students, she looked forward to enjoying her last month of school before pursuing a career in medicine. Louise was not only a talented artist and photographer, but also known for her reputation as a responsible and well-mannered young woman. When her mother lost her job due to health issues, Louise decided to temporarily set aside her dream and started contributing financially to her family. In January 2004, she took a part-time job at McDonald's. Earning $6.35 per hour, Louise was considered a reliable employee who never hesitated to take on extra shifts to help her colleagues. On Friday, April 9th at 4.45 p.m., as Louise was preparing to go home after her shift, she was asked to stay a bit longer to cover for a sick colleague. Without hesitation, she agreed, aiming to assist and earn some extra income. At 4.56, the work phone rang, and Donna Summers, a 51-year-old assistant manager for about eight months, answered the call. The caller identified himself as Officer Scott. Officer Scott claimed that the restaurant's general manager, Lisa Siddons, was also on the line with him. He explained that he was calling because a girl who had recently been in the establishment had her wallet stolen and they suspected someone on Summer's staff. Scott provided a description of the suspect, a young slender girl with dark hair wearing the restaurant uniform. Summers immediately thought of Louise. Despite Louise having an excellent work record, she fit the description perfectly. Leaving Officer Scott on the line, Summers asked Louise to accompany her to the manager's office. Donna led Louise into the office and locked the door. Donna informed Louise that a police officer accused her of stealing a wallet. Shocked, Louise immediately declared her innocence, stating that she could never steal anything. Donna explained that the police officer had described Louise as a suspect in the theft. Officer Scott was still on the line, and Summers alternated between talking to him and Louise. Scott informed Summers that the girl had a choice. She could consent to a search on the spot, or wait for the officer to arrive, arrest her, and conduct the search at the police station. Learning of these options, Louise began to cry and thought it would be better to go to the police station to resolve the matter there. However, Summers handed the phone to Louise, and after talking to Officer Scott, she agreed to a search right in the restaurant. Scott directed Summers, who relayed instructions to Louise. Initially, Louise was asked to empty her pockets, and she complied without objections. After handing over her keys and mobile phone, Louise showed that there was no stolen wallet in her pockets. However, Scott suspected that it might be hidden under her clothing and ordered her to remove it. It's worth noting that at this point, Kim Dockery, also acting as an assistant manager, arrived for the evening shift. Kim asked what was happening, but Summers refused to explain, following Officer Scott's demand. In the presence of Donna and Kim, Louise reluctantly removed her uniform and was left only in her underwear. She covered her face with her hands and cried while Donna examined her clothing. There was no stolen wallet in her clothes, but this was deemed insufficient. Louise was then ordered to remove the remaining clothes and hand them over to Donna for inspection. Louise complied. All of this became too much for Donna Summers, who started doubting the truthfulness of the accusations against Louise. In response, Scott made a shocking statement. The police were investigating Louise's involvement in more serious crimes, and officers were currently searching her family's home for illicit substances. Thus, Louise's clothing and other belongings were considered evidence in the investigation. Scott ordered Summers to put them in a bag and take them to her car so he could pick them up shortly. During this time, Kim tried to comfort Louise. She gave her an apron to cover herself. As the restaurant was crowded, Kim returned to her work. Summers told the police officer that she also needed to work. 
Then Officer Scott asked her to find a male employee who would watch over Louise until the police arrived. Summers called 27-year-old restaurant cook Jason Bradley. She left him in the office with Louise and the phone while she returned to her duties. The young man tried not to look at Louise, who was covered with a dirty apron, while listening to Officer Scott's instructions. Learning that Louise had nothing on except the apron, the police officer ordered Jason to take it from her and describe Louise to him. This demand upset Jason. After talking to Scott for just a few minutes, he stormed out of the office and told Donna Summers that he considered it discrimination. He declared to Donna that he wouldn't participate and was going back to the kitchen. Summers didn't understand what had offended Jason and picked up the phone again. She explained to the police officer that there was no one to watch over Louise. In response, Scott asked if she was married. Summers chuckled and admitted that she was engaged. When asked if she trusted her fiancé, Summers naturally answered yes. Scott then asked if her fiancé could come to the restaurant to keep an eye on the girl. Summers agreed to call him. Walter Nix Jr. was a 42-year-old father of two, working as an exterminator and coaching the local youth baseball team. He was generally considered a respected member of the community. He had recently become engaged to Donna Summers. Shortly before 6 p.m., Summers called her fiancé on her mobile phone. She explained that a restaurant employee was suspected of stealing a wallet and she asked if he could watch over her until the police arrived. Nix agreed. When he arrived at McDonald's, Summers led him into the office and left him alone with Louise and the office phone. Louise stood against the wall, leaning back, crying. As soon as Donna left the office, Officer Scott wasted no time. He ordered Nix to take the apron from Louise and describe her to him. Unlike Jason, Nix complied with this demand. He did not refuse subsequent instructions. Nix forced Louise to stand on a chair to inspect her more thoroughly. Then he compelled her to jump to ensure she wasn't hiding anything of interest to Officer Scott. Occasionally, Nix handed Louise the phone to speak with the police officer. Scott quickly convinced the girl that if she wanted to keep her job, she should cooperate. Donna or Kim would periodically enter the office. Each time Nix heard them approaching, following Officer Scott's orders, he threw the apron to Louise and gestured for her to be quiet, placing a finger to his lips. When the clock showed 6.50 p.m., Louise had spent almost an hour with Nix. Officer Scott's demands were becoming increasingly alarming. When Louise failed to address Nix with a distinctly polite sir and continued asking questions, Nix was ordered to slap her. Despite Louise insisting that Scott's demands were absurd, Nix listened to the police officer, not her. A few minutes later, Summers returned to the office. As she approached to grab something, Louise put her head on her shoulder and quietly pleaded for her to take her away. Donna, please take me out of here, Donna, please. Please believe me, I didn't do anything wrong, the girl said. She asked Summers to call the police, but Summers replied that they were already waiting for the police to arrive. Summers left again. Louise also wanted to escape, but couldn't. The only way out would be to run through the entire restaurant where there were many customers. Additionally, Louise was frightened by Nix's appearance, as he was much taller and weighed 104 kilograms. When Nix and Louise were alone again, Officer Scott resumed his instructions. He made Nix sit the girl on his lap and kiss her to examine her breath. Later, Louise would recount that at this moment, she became paralyzed and felt as if her consciousness had detached from her body. Shortly before 7.30 p.m., Scott demanded something unimaginable, that Louise remove Nix's pants and satisfy him. The girl cried and pleaded, saying, No, I haven't done anything wrong. This is ridiculous. But Nix threatened her with physical punishment if she did not comply with the police's orders. Finally, Louise gave in. Ten minutes later, at 7.52 p.m., Donna entered the office to retrieve some gift certificates. Louise and Nix, as before, were in different corners of the office. Following Scott's orders, Nix handed the phone to Summers and left the restaurant, getting into his car. When he arrived home, he called a friend, telling him, I did something incredibly horrible. At the same time, Donna was ordered to find someone to replace Nix in the manager's office. She chose 58-year-old employee Thomas Sims, who wasn't working that day and had just stopped by the restaurant for coffee and dessert. Summers asked the man to accompany her to the office, where Louise was inside. Baffled, Thomas took the phone, and Summers left him alone with the girl. Following the familiar pattern, Officer Scott ordered Thomas to take the apron from Louise and describe her to him. Thomas refused to comply and went out to find Summers. He told her about Scott's outrageous request and stated, Something is not right here. Thomas demanded to return the girl's clothes and call the police. Summers, shocked, called the restaurant's general manager, Lisa Siddons. 
who was supposedly on the other line with Officer Scott the entire time. Siddons answered the call with an evidently tired voice, having no idea what Summers was talking about and explaining that she had been sleeping. Once Summers realized she had been deceived, the fake police officer abruptly ended the conversation. By this time, Louise had been in the office for almost three hours. Shivering from cold and shock, she asked if she needed to come to work tomorrow. Kim reassured the girl that she could take as much time off as needed. Louise was given back her clothes and allowed to get dressed, while Summers started apologizing. Panicking restaurant employees and managers gathered in the office. After discussing the situation among themselves, around 9 p.m., they decided to call the police. Since the police station was less than a kilometer away, real police officers arrived within just five minutes. Buddy Stump, a detective from the city police station, was among the colleagues who arrived at the establishment and couldn't believe his ears when he heard what had happened. The surveillance camera in the office captured everything that occurred with Louise. The video infuriated the detective, and he suspected that someone had made the call using a prepaid phone card from within the McDonald's to observe how the prank unfolded. The next day, the local police chief decided to search for information about similar pranks on the internet. To the surprise of both Chief and Detective Stump, the search yielded hundreds of matches. Similar calls were documented in various states. In each case, the caller pretended to be a police officer or a manager, then asked the store or restaurant manager to assist in an investigation. The requests always involved a thorough search of young women. The prankster targeted fast food chain restaurants in small towns and had been active for 12 years. Interestingly, this wasn't the first incident in Kentucky. In 2000, a McDonald's manager responded to a call from someone claiming to be a police officer. The caller suspected a customer of a crime and convinced the manager to remove her clothes to act as bait for the alleged perpetrator. He guaranteed that undercover officers were monitoring the situation and would come to her rescue before the suspect could harm her. In another incident at a Burger King in Indiana, the fake officer persuaded the manager to search a young female employee. When the girl's father arrived, as usual, to take her home, he had to literally jump over the counter and forcibly make the manager release his daughter. By the end of 2003, there were almost 60 similar incidents reported. Upon learning the extent of the prankster's crimes, Detective Buddy Stamp set a goal to find and apprehend him once and for all. Fortunately, someone in the McDonald's restaurant managed to dial asterisk 69 when Officer Scott finished the call. This function allowed them to trace the call. Detective Stamp determined that a prepaid AT&T phone card was used for the call, sold at a Walmart in Panama City, Florida, on April 9th at 3.02 p.m., less than two hours before the incident with Louise began. Stamp's colleagues in Panama City connected him with Detective Victor Flaherty, an investigator from Massachusetts, who was probing similar calls to Boston restaurants. Flaherty also linked the Boston calls to prepaid AT&T cards sold in Panama City supermarkets. By comparing surveillance camera images of card buyers at Walmart, the police discovered that the person of interest was a man in the uniform of a local prison supervisor. They quickly identified the suspect as 38-year-old David Stewart. Stewart was married and raising five children, having worked in the prison for 11 months. Previously, he had worked as a security guard in a shopping center and as a truck driver. Flaherty went to Stewart's home, introduced himself, and asked if he had a prepaid phone card. The man sweated profusely and inquired if anyone was harmed. When told that no one was physically harmed, but the psychological recovery would take years, he exclaimed, Finally, it's all over. Despite his exclamation, Stewart denied any knowledge of the calls or having a phone card. He called a lawyer and invoked his right to remain silent. Police searched Stewart's trailer home, finding numerous police journals and dozens of rejected police job applications. Only one phone card was found in the trailer, and it turned out to be not the one used for the call to McDonald's in Kentucky, Mount Washington, although it was used for nine other calls in 2003. Law enforcement in Mount Washington charged Stewart, and he was transferred to Kentucky. In case of a guilty verdict, he faced a 15-year prison sentence. Around the same time, Louise agreed to give an interview and share what happened during that incident. She explained how she trusted Donna Sammers, believing that as an assistant manager, she would take care of her employees. Louise confessed that her greatest desire at that moment was to escape from the office, but in her perception, fleeing from the office would be equivalent to fleeing from the police. Additionally, 
Her family depended financially on her job, and she feared losing it. She also noted that her parents had taught her to obey and not argue when an adult asked her for something. Louise's interview was supplemented with comments from a clinical psychologist who confirmed that her description of feeling as if her consciousness had separated from her body was common among people who had experienced similar situations. As a result of the prank call, Walter Nix faced serious charges. Donna was shown what her fiancé had done to Louise, and she immediately ended her relationship with him. Initially, Summers was suspended from work at the restaurant and later dismissed. McDonald's cited a violation of company rules, specifically that the woman brought a stranger into the office as the reason for her dismissal. Summers was also charged with unlawful imprisonment. Her colleague, Kim Dockery, was transferred to another restaurant. Collectively, the charges against Nix could have led to a 20-year prison sentence. In February 2006, he pleaded guilty to assault and unlawful imprisonment in exchange for a five-year prison term. He claimed that he himself became a victim because he sincerely believed in following the police officer's orders, even when the orders became inhumane. During the trial, he apologized to Louise. Summers was sentenced to a year of probation, although the prosecutor insisted on actual imprisonment. He explained, it didn't matter whether Summers thought she was dealing with a police officer or not. If the President of the United States ordered to take a girl's clothes and lock her in a room, there would be no justification for that. However, some leniency was shown towards her after Louise revealed that her manager had been deceived and she became another victim of the crime. The trial of Stewart began on October 24, 2006, following the court decisions in the cases of Nix and Summers so they could testify against him. Nix claimed in court that he simply followed Officer Scott's instructions. Donna asserted that she spoke with three, as it seemed to her, different people, and heard a police raid in the background. Moreover, Scott knew the names of several employees and a customer in the restaurant, claiming that the general manager of the establishment, Lisa, was on the other line, so Donna believed she was talking to a real police officer. Detective Stamp questioned how Stewart could know the names of the employees and customers. He replied that he did not know because investigators could never confirm these claims. The bombshell effect was produced by the testimony of Thomas Sims, a restaurant worker who put an end to the cruel prank. According to him, Louise said she would receive a substantial check as a result of what she went through. Thomas admitted that he never reported this statement to the police and only informed McDonald's management. Stewart's lawyers skillfully used this testimony to suggest that Louise staged the entire incident to demand compensation from McDonald's. The defense also argued that the prosecution lacked sufficient evidence and the discovered phone card was not the one used to make the call to McDonald's in Kentucky, Mount Washington. Furthermore, the fact that Stewart bought the card does not prove that he used it. On October 31st, the jury found Stewart not guilty and all charges were dropped. Despite this, the prosecutors were convinced that they caught the right person as there were no calls from the prankster since his arrest. Louise filed a $200 million civil lawsuit against McDonald's, blaming the company for not informing employees about the prankster, even though the company knew about the prankster for at least two years. There were about 30 other calls to McDonald's, and 12 cases resulted in lawsuits in four different states. All these cases ended in out-of-court settlements. Louise's case was the only one that went to trial. The jury was given 12 possible verdict options. They deliberated for a long time and finally decided that part of the blame for what happened lay with the prankster and the other part was on McDonald's. They ruled that the company would pay Louise over $6 million. It later became known that the jury members took a long time to deliberate because they couldn't agree on the compensation amount for Louise. One juror wanted to give her $100 million, while another insisted on just $1. As a result of an unsuccessful appeal, McDonald's was obliged to pay an additional $2.4 million to cover legal expenses. Incredibly, Donna also filed a $50 million lawsuit against McDonald's, claiming that the management did not warn restaurant managers about the prankster. In response, McDonald's stated that they initially did not inform managers because they did not want them to refuse to cooperate with real police officers. However, a few days before the incident in Kentucky, they did send a voice message to managers with a warning. They also argued that the strip search went against their rules since 2001, something Summers should have known. The company's representatives blamed Summers and Nix for the incident, as well as Louise herself, noting that all three should have understood that the call was a prank. 
Nevertheless, the jury decided to award Donna over $1.1 million, although the amount was later reduced to $500,000. Louise never returned to work at McDonald's. The incident left an indelible mark on her, and she had to take a long time to recover from the cruel prank. She was too traumatized to attend college as she had planned. Nevertheless, she gradually began to recover. She found a job at a law firm, met a nice young man, and soon became a mother. After receiving compensation, she admitted that she would use the funds to study law since her initial plans to become a medical professional were shattered. You never know how you'll act until you find yourself in a specific situation. One might wonder what's wrong with Donna or Nick's, but more than 60 people acted exactly like Donna Summers. Why do we so easily obey orders, even when we know they are wrong? Why are we willing to inflict pain on others if someone else takes responsibility for it? There are a couple of well-known experiments that explain how the prankster managed to turn people into his puppets. In the 1960s, psychologist Stanley Milgram conducted what is now known as the Milgram Experiment on Obedience in Psychology. The professor told participants that he was studying the learning process, but in reality he was studying people's willingness to obey authority figures. Participants were asked to administer electric shocks with increasing voltage to people who incorrectly answered questions. In reality, these people were actors who did not suffer from electric shocks. However, the experiment showed that over 65% of participants would administer the maximum voltage to an innocent learner just because a person in a white lab coat told them to. In 1971, Professor Philip Zimbardo conducted a similar experiment known as the Stanford Prison Experiment. He divided student volunteers into two groups, with some becoming prisoners and others guards. The professor studied the psychological effect of obtained power. The experiment had to be terminated after just six days because the students quickly immersed themselves in their roles and the guards began to show aggression towards the prisoners. Professor Zimbardo later hired a consultant from one of the fast food restaurant chains who became a victim of the prankster. He concluded that the criminal had read Milgram's work because he applied basic techniques of gaining control over people. The caller presented himself as a person with authority. He insisted on being treated with pronounced respect, using such terms as sir. The caller told people that he took full responsibility and all consequences of what was happening. In case of resistance, he told people that they had to continue because they had no other choice. 